9 strangers, 1 kidnapper and a 10 minute timer after which one victim is clapped, one by one. The rules are simple, the 9 strangers must figure out a story that connects them and if they can't reveal the secret within 10 minutes, one is killed after which the timer starts anew. Well, in this video we follow the victims in the movie 9 Dead, figure out what they could have done instead than wasting their precious time about each other and ultimately figure out how we could have beaten the 10 minute death game in 9 Dead. At the start of this movie, we witnessed 9 seemingly unrelated strangers being preyed upon and kidnapped one by one. The police have already started an investigation and every major news outlet is spreading the news. All these ruthless kidnappings take place in LA. Now none of this is of actual interest, because these kidnappings themselves only play a minor role and sort of build the foundation of the rest of this movie. Once all the victims have been gathered, the real deal starts. The perpetrator takes off their blinds and rips away the tapes covering their mouths and welcomes them to his sick game. The rules are just like mentioned, they must figure out why they're here. They have 10 minutes time and after every 10 minutes one of them will be killed. The timer is then set to another 10 minutes and the game continues until everyone is either dead or the reason has been figured out. If they can name the reason of why they're here, the kidnapper will release them, call in the police and confess to every crime that he had committed. Now first of all, that's a pretty straightforward rule and hard to misunderstand, right? But why would you believe anything this dude says? I don't know about y'all, but this guy does not seem to be the most trustworthy person in this room. But it's also true that if he wanted to kill me, you or anyone else in here, he could have done that already, right? Leaves us only two possibilities, either he is a sick maniac who gets off by observing people that are being tortured or he tells the truth. Now for what it's worth, it doesn't really matter. The only real choices we have are find out the reason, like he told us to, try to escape or give up and do nothing. Suffice to say that trying to escape should be one thing you should try no matter what. Now one thing that pops up instantly is the fact that all victims are completely different from one another. We got a Chinese lady, a strip club owner, a police guy, a lawyer, a hustler, a pedophile, a pastor, although the lines blur there, an insurance salesman and at last a convicted shoplifter. We got different ethnicities, all ages and all genders. Not only does this eliminate prejudice as a motive, but it does support the claim that they are related to each other. And I'll tell you why. Apart from the Chinese lady, who is a shop owner, all occupations present revolve around crime. Yet none of these characters can figure that out, which is crazy. I mean, that's literally the single most obvious connection there is. The other super strange thing is, if one of them is killed every 10 minutes, does this mean that the solution will be more difficult to figure out or is it something that can be figured out without the need of investigating each and every person in here? Sort of like a fact that each one of them knows and once figured out, they're safe. I mean, if it is a story, like a real incident in which all of them had a separate role in, then it becomes increasingly more difficult with every round because now there's one person less, meaning there's one piece of the puzzle missing. If that is the case, then wasting any time is literally the worst thing to do. Not only do you have an 11.1% .1 chance of dying during the first round, which increases exponentially every new round, but on top of that, your chance of figuring out the safe word drops significantly. In any way, when the game starts and the perpetrator has left the room after passing them a bunch of chalk pieces, virtually none of the 10 minutes are used productively. Most people in here claim it to be a scam and nothing will happen after the 10 minutes pass. But after you've been tasered and kidnapped in a lone parking lot, I am not sure if that is the right thing to think. What do you think? I mean this room straight up looks like a soft franchise studio. More interesting though is that at this point right here, our guy here tries to forcefully break the pole out of its fixture. And to be fair, it gives a lot. There is a good chance you would be able to break it if you maintain momentum and just kept on bending. I wouldn't give up on that. While the timer is ticking down, everyone is talking across each other. 
There is no plan, no strategy, nothing. And this is the problem with group assignments. You're literally done for when you're assigned to a bunch of bozos, which happened right here. Now imagine failure means death. Obviously, the only right thing to do at this stage is to let everyone introduce themselves as quickly as possible. We got 9 people, meaning if everyone gets 45 seconds, they still have just a little over 3 minutes left afterwards to arrive at a conclusion. Name, occupation, including company name, and everyone's address are the most important things here. You see, most people spend most of their lives between home and work. If there is a connection between 9 strangers, the chances are huge that it is related to their home or work. Now I might add here that none of them know the occupations of each other at this point. Okay? I revealed that before just to make it more obvious to you how important this info is. However, during the first round, we know about this lady being a lawyer, this dude with the pedo stash, a pedo, surprise, surprise, and this kid, a convicted shoplifter who had borrowed money from Solly, this guy right here, who is a strip bar owner and also with the mob. The kid says something that will become very important later on. He says that he had nothing coming out of prison back in May but was able to pay back Sully in full after he had hit the streets in May as well. We'll come back to that again. At this point, however, the last few seconds of the clock run out, zero is displayed, and the kidnapper comes in and asks, Why are you here? And sure enough, none of these characters have the slightest idea. The first one to be killed is this guy, the kid who has shared the most, in fact. Coincidence or plan? Well, we'll see. He drags the corpse out of the room and the next round starts. But this time around, they're doing things a little bit better. Everyone shares a little bit about themselves and we get the few flashbacks displaying who is who. The hustler, whose name is Leon, used to invade homes with his brother and sell firearms on the black market. And the cop and the lawyer used to have an affair a few years ago. They're finally starting to map out some of the connections between them, but their efficiency still sucks. Again, 45 seconds per person and boom, everyone knows what to do, everyone is on edge and we rush through these infos like a bullet train. But like that, void of any structure, this will fail. Now at this point, Leon here comes up with the first useful plan so far. You're crazy man. You got a better idea? Break my hands and get out these cuffs. He convinces Sully to break his hand by stomping on it so that he can get through the cuffs and escape. I'm not sure if that is something that would actually work. I don't think most people could sustain multiple heavy pounds at an already fractured hand voluntarily, but so be it. Now, once the hand is broken enough, he slips through the cuffs and commits the dumbest mistake yet. He escapes alone, or he tries to. You know you can't leave us in here. Don't leave us here. Damn it. Now he doesn't get very far, he is caught by the kidnapper and the fight breaks out. Which he wins, almost, but screws things up and is shot pretty much dead. Now the mistake he made was escaping alone, why would he do that? This right here was to take it out. There is only one door to this room, he could not be surprised from behind. He could literally just focus on getting the people out of their cuffs, after which they would have had to clear upper hand. Here's how I would have done that. There are actually multiple ways on how to crack professional handcuffs that are surprisingly simple. You see, the kidnapper has not stripped anyone of their items, which is a pretty stupid thing. Multiple people still wear their jewelry like necklaces, earrings, etc. Chances are somebody carries something to pick the lock with. Anything as pointy as a paperclip is enough as you can see in this video right here. Now of course it only works if somebody has something like that. Also for that technically you wouldn't even need someone like Leon to be free. But since the kidnapper has cameras installed there is no chance that he would let anyone fiddle around with the cuffs without interfering. So firstly Leon should have located the surveillance cameras and break them. Secondly he should have either helped someone to break free, preferably Sully or the policemen since they are likely to be the strongest people in here or hang on a doorknob to prevent the kidnapper from entering. Now the doorknob isn't really a doorknob here and that's a pretty good thing. It's more like a vault or a nuclear bunker lock. Leon is a heavy dude. He would literally just need to sit down and use his body weight to pull down the wheel to keep the kidnapper out. 
Now, there are two valid options for the others to break free. Number one, like mentioned, is picking the lock with something like a paperclip. And the other option would be to break the chain link of the cuffs themselves. This is surprisingly easy. Now, this guy in this video is able to break out of his cuffs within 10 minutes of trying without anything but leverage and force. What he does is, he gets the link to lock by shifting it back and forth, and once it's locked, he just leverages the link apart by twisting his hands just a tiny bit. It's pretty impressive even when you sucked in physics class. The cuffs used in this movie are of the same nature, so this would definitely work. And having one hand free and a sturdy iron pole cuffed on the other side will certainly help as well. I guess the point of all this is, the more people are freed, the higher the chances of making it out alive. Something Leon has not considered. You think I give a damn about you? Anyway, he is dragged back into the room and cuffed to the pole one more time. He is heavily wounded, but still alive. But here comes the real deal. Just before round 3 starts, the kidnapper takes out the pedo, hell yeah, and makes clear that the next one to be shot will be Leon. Now this is amazing. I mean, it sucks for him, but for all others, it means 20 whole minutes of either figuring out the secret or breaking out. And 20 minutes is a lot of time. <laughs> oh, look, we got another 10 minutes. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, the Chinese lady starts remembering the lawyer, which is pretty late if you ask me, especially when you knew that the task was literally finding out the connection between each other. Anyway, she starts gesturing like a Chinese expat owning a corn shop in Italy, while the others start guessing what she could mean because she doesn't speak any English. The lawyer realizes that this lady has been one of her clients who had faced an armed robbery a few years ago. Now she recalls the guy who had robbed the store and even figures out his name. His name was Wade Greeley, a 20 year old loser who was put in jail because of her. Now mind you, this woman does not remember her client whom she worked with for probably weeks or even months back then, but she remembers the first and last name of the robber. That's a little crazy if you ask me. But whatever you want to think about that, this triggers a cascade of new revelations. Wade Greeley was put away two years ago. All others in here are certain that they don't know Mrs. Chen, who is a Chinese lady, meaning that the only connection between her and anybody else in here is the connections between her and this lawyer. This means that all of this seems to have something to do with Wade Greeley. At least that's what it looks like, right? Well, until Leon has a change of heart and reveals two more important details. He confesses that he has killed his own brother two years ago and haven't gone off to sell the rest of their stash, which as we now know were unregistered firearms, and that when he tried to escape just a moment ago, the kidnapper himself has revealed that he has planned this whole thing for two years. Meaning the connection between all of them indeed looks like to have started two years ago around the same time when Wade Greeley was put away by this lawyer. The timer once again hits zero, the kidnapper comes in, asks his question, and gets a no as an answer. This time he takes Leon with him. Ten minutes more until another one bites the dust. Now while everyone is speculating what it could be, it seems like the pastor is onto something. But even though he says he knows why they are all here, he refuses to tell anyone due to religious reasons. Now obviously that is enough for all others to call him out, and fair enough. I mean imagine someone has a solution to a quiz that saves 5 human lives but refuses to answer because of religion. I would be pretty pissed as well. Now they can eventually pressure him so much that he eventually admits this. What if I said that I knew for a fact that Wade Greeley did not rob Chan's store? Now coming from a pastor, this is pretty revealing. This detail is enough for them to connect even more dots. It's revealed that Christian, the first one who was killed in this game, was the one who had robbed Mrs. Chan's store instead of Wade Greeley. When Christian got out of prison, he still owed money to Sully, therefore he robbed the store to pay back his debts. But instead, Wade Greeley was convicted. The lawyer obviously made a mistake, or so. The pastor knew about it, but kept quiet after Christian had confessed to him. Leon gave Christian the gun to rob the store, and Mrs. Chen identified the wrong person. He said that he got out of jail in May and paid you soon after. How else could he have gotten the money? 
Now before the last dots can be connected though, the timer again hits zero and the kidnapper comes in to pick the next victim. It's Eddie. However, the pastor is quick enough to throw himself in front of him and bites the bullet instead. Now mind you, everything they just found out could have been figured out at the very beginning. If everybody just came forward with the simplest of things, which is who knows who, the mystery could have been solved already. The only one who admitted to everything was Christian in round number one when he admitted of knowing Sully. And that is another reason for avoiding group assignments, my friends. It doesn't matter if you are an A1 student, if you work with bozos, the chance that they will drag you down before you can lift them up is 100%. And the next round is proof for that. Despite the significant progress they had just made, this round is completely wasted for the sake of arguing. And the loudest person is, surprise surprise, the lawyer. And no wonder. As the timer hits zero again, with no progress made, Mrs. Chen is the next one to die. The next round is almost a finale. In fact, the lawyer had faked the evidence to convict Wade Greeley, who wasn't the perpetrator to begin with. She just needed a conviction for her career. Another fact that could have been revealed much earlier is that since she had an affair with a police guy, she used him to exchange her fake evidence with the real evidence. Now that's all serious and stuff, I know, but can we talk about the following for a second, please? Sully is the next one in line to die, but I mean, at this stage, you might as well try to grab this gun, no? Especially with just an inch away from your face. If you can get this gun, which seems to be easier than trying to team up with those people anyway, then you're free. You might die in the process, but I'd take that road any day over being killed spending my last few seconds hearing those bozos arguing. Maybe we do deserve to die. I just wish I knew why. During the last round, the secret is finally lifted. After Wade Greeley got into prison, he ran into the pedo who, well, did what we would expect someone like Ted to do. The problem was that he was infected with AIDS. Pass that to Wade Greeley, and that's how the last piece of the puzzle, Eddie, the insurance salesman, is tied in. He used to give out permissions to a new AIDS drug that his company had the license to. Wade Greeley could have been a candidate who was denied. Eddie claims that his name and signature was in every letter he sent out, whether permitted or denied. Now the reason why they believed that the pedo, whose name was Coogan by the way, had AIDS was because of a subtle line that he had uttered just before he died. They aren't sure about it, but it ties in perfectly well. They now speculate that the kidnapper could be Wade Greeley's father or something of that sort. And just at that moment, the clock strikes zero again, but this time things turn out a little different. Eddie recites everything I had just mentioned and hits the nail on the head. Wade Greeley was indeed this guy's son and had passed away not too long ago due to AIDS. He admits of having called the police already to confess and well passes them the key to release themselves. But he hasn't considered one thing, the narcissistic, self-absorbed lawyer in that room. Scared that what she had done to Wade Greeley all those years ago would make it to the public, she takes away his gun, shoots pretty much everyone in this room and runs away. Is she caught? Well, not really, because this movie ends in a massive, very unsatisfying cliffhanger that I would have rather skipped, not gonna lie. She seemingly just escapes. Ugh. Well, and this was this movie. Let me know what you think. How would you have handled this situation if you were in the character's shoes? Let me know down below. Leave a like if you've enjoyed this, and I'll see you again next week. Take care, peace out, and binge another one.